Are you tired of hearing nothing but bad news? Tune in to the good news of the gospel. Greg Fritz has been changing lives through the good news of the gospel for over 35 years. This good news will inspire, inform, and change you so you can live daily in all the promises of God. Welcome to Good News with Greg Fritz. Welcome to the Good News program. I'm Greg Fritz, and we have got another great program for you today. We are talking about get out of the rut and get on with your life. Now, I've been very careful. I don't like to overpromise and underdeliver, but I have to say the teaching that we're going to get into is going to be memorable. You are going to love this teaching. It's going to be practical. I've preached this message in other places and it, months and years later people have reminded me of these principles. So I know you're going to like it. And if you don't, I'll give you your money back. How's that? I want to tell you this. We've got all of the teaching on this subject, 15 sessions on Get Out of the Rut, and it's all free. Just go to my website to the free download section. You can get it in audio or video on demand streaming. Uh, you could have it on your device within minutes watching programs before or even after this one and learn about getting out of the rut. We're gonna get into some teaching now and I'm gonna tell you some stories and they're all true, uh, give you some illustrations and I believe it's really gonna help you in your walk with God. We've talked about, just for a moment to review, different lies or ways of thinking that have kept people in bondage or kept people in a rut. The first one was that thinking that I have no man or I have no help, I have nobody to help me. The second one was I have no money. Sometimes people allow the fact that they don't have a lot of money keep them from doing anything. And the principle is, look, you may not have much, but you can do something. Rather than I don't have much, I can't do anything, do something with what you have. And then we talked about the feeling of having no power or I have no power, I have no ability against this opposition, against this great army that I'm facing, this great challenge. And that's just feelings, and it's not true. You don't have to go by feelings. You have the victory. But I want to give you some practical steps. Those are things that are kind of the negative side of the equation. But I want to give you some practical, positive steps that you can take to start moving again. If you feel like you've been stagnant or stuck in a rut, you want to move forward in your life, I can tell you, uh, give you some 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 pointers here, some advice, some steps to take that you can begin right now to move forward again and give you something to sink your teeth into. In fact, I'm going to give you these three steps and we're going to cover them in the next few episodes. But number one, you can write this down. Oh, also, you can go get our study notes and these will be in our study notes, getting out of the rut, get out of the rut study notes on our website. But number one, use what you have. Use what you have. Number two, do what you can. And number three, start where you are. And I know that's simple, but it's profound. And it works with, with people in any situation in life. But provided you're, you're, you're living for God, you love God, you're right with God, your, your, your motives are just to, to live life, to do your best, to go forward and do something positive with your life, assuming that those things are you know, in place, uh, you can begin to move forward by using what you have, doing what you can, and starting where you are. And so let's begin with this first one. Number one, use what you have. You could spend all day talking about what you don't have. <laughs> it's easy to focus on what we don't have. We can all get depressed by thinking about what we don't have. I don't have any friends or I don't have any money. I don't have support. I don't have vision. I don't have this or I don't have a wife. I don't have a husband. There's all kinds of things that can, that can clutter our minds about what we don't have and that's not going to get you anywhere. The point here is uh, use what you have. And this is a spiritual principle, and it's listed over and over in the Bible. No, uh, the first place that we can go to is 2 Kings 4. And I think you're going to see this principle. You're going to really latch on to this because it's so applicable in, in everyone's life. 2, Corinth, or 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 1 says, A certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophet 
crying out to Elisha, saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your servant feared the Lord, and the creditor is coming to take away my two sons to be his slaves. So Elisha said to her, What shall I do for you? Tell me, what do you have? I love that. And let's go back and read that again. Elisha said, what shall I do? Tell me what you do have. So this woman was in a desperate situation. Her husband was a prophet, probably didn't make a lot of money. And he died. She's a widow now with two kids. And I'm sure Elisha was familiar or friends with her husband. And Elisha's the most notable prophet in the land. And this woman's desperate. She's just looking for some help. And, and probably Elisha's the most powerful person that she knows. Not necessarily the richest, but at least he's powerful and influential. So she goes to Elisha and she tells Elisha what she doesn't have. And isn't that the tendency? It's so common to focus on what we don't have. I don't have a husband. I don't have any money. I don't have any way to make money. I don't have any wisdom to get out of this situation. Well, that's clear. And it's easy to let that dominate your life. And it's easy to take all of that into consideration and then just quit, give up, go sit in a corner and feel sorry for yourself. And you know, that is an option. <laughs> and that's why some people are stuck in a rut because they're just sitting in a corner feeling sorry for themselves, focusing on everything they don't have. And when they see someone else that has something they don't, they're jealous or they're disappointed or they're sad. It just creates this horrible failure of an attitude. So she goes to Elisha and tells him what she doesn't have. And Elisha says this, <laughs> Tell me, what do you have? Oh, that's so good. That is so powerful. What do you have in the house? And she said, your maidservant has nothing in the house. But, <laughs> you know, it's so hard to get to this one, you know, the one positive thing in your life, the key to your miracle. I'm telling you, the devil wants you to think that the key to your miracle is beyond your reach. That what you need, you don't have. The help you need isn't coming. What you need to know, you'll never know. What you need God to do, He's not going to do. What the, You need to get in the pool and you can't. Or you need money and you don't have any. Or you need power and you don't have any power. He wants you to just completely give up. And Elisha says, what do you have? And she says, nothing, but, 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 but a jar of oil. Ah, he said, go borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors, empty vessels. Don't gather just a few. And when you come in, you'll shut the door behind you and your sons and you'll pour it into all those vessels and set aside the full ones. And she went out from him, shut the door and her sons who brought her the vessels and poured it out. And it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said to her son, bring another vessel. And they said, there is not another vessel. So the oil ceased. Then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil, pay your debt, you and your sons shall live on the rest. This is a principle that is true in the Bible. It's true in the Old Testament. It's true in the New Testament, and it's true in your life. And I cannot stress that enough. Her miracle began with what she had. Obviously, Elisha could have said, Well, you poor lady, you've had it rough. You know, all you want to do is serve God and your husband served God and he died and you're poor now and your sons are going to be taken into slavery. You know what? Just sit down and let me perform a miracle of provision in your house or before your eyes. Let me just do it. But that's not what happened. He said, what do you have? Start with what you have. Focus on what you have. And she said, I don't have anything but a jar of oil. What is that? It's just a jar. He said, that'll work. What does this mean exactly? What if she just said, uh, what was oil the magic formula? Was it, be, was it, what if she said, I have a jar of flour? Would he have said, oh, I'm sorry, I can't do a thing for you. You're just going to have to be poor. 
What if he'd, he'd have said, you know, she'd have said, I have a jar of, uh, uh, you know, of something else. Uh, what, what would he have said? Uh, of oats, I have a jar of oats. Would he have said, oh, sorry, that's not going to work. But oil, that is the secret ingredient. No, it didn't have anything to do with the substance in and of itself. It's the fact that she had something to start with. God wants you to use what you have. We are making a big mistake when we look over the things we have and focus on what we don't have. Be good stewards. Use what you have. She took the oil and that was the beginning of her miracle. It was already in her hand. The same is true in Exodus 4. Let's look at this because as I said, it, it, this principle is used over and over in the Bible. God appeared to Moses and said, I'm going to use you to deliver Israel from Pharaoh. And he felt powerless. He felt helpless. He felt small. He, he, he had a speech impediment. He had a lot of things working. Besides that, he was 80 years old. He had a lot of excuses. And God said, I'm going to send you to Pharaoh and you're going to set my people free. And in verse one, Moses answered and said, but suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say the Lord has not appeared to you. Isn't that something? I'm, of course, they're going to say that he's going to go to Pharaoh and say, I want three million people, your entire workforce. I want you to just let them go tomorrow. And, and what's he going to say? Uh, get out of my house. I'm not listening. I'm not, I don't believe that God sent you. So Moses is he's kind of looking ahead to the inevitable. And he says, what if they don't believe me? And God said this. What is that in your hand? <laughs> Isn't that something? Moses is looking to God do something. I need something come, to come down from heaven. I need something I don't have. I need you to do something I can't do. I need somebody to appear that I don't even know. I need a miracle. And God says, well, what is that in your hand? And, and, and he said, <laughs> you can read it here in verse 2. He said, a rod. I can just see the look on his face. It, it was a stick. It was a walking stick. He probably found it in the woods. And maybe he trimmed it down so he could hold on to it. And it was, a, it was like a cane, a walking stick. And he was totally underwhelmed. God said, what is that in here? He's talking about a real problem here. I've got a real problem. Pharaoh's not going to believe me. The Israelites aren't going to believe me. I'm just going to show up and tell them I came to deliver an entire nation. And, 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 he, and God says, what is that in your hand? And he goes, a, a rod. Is that the way you feel about your possessions? Maybe you feel like, you know what? The key to my miracle is not even in this hemisphere. What I need can't even be described. Yes, it can. God can take what you have and do a miracle. But you've got to appreciate what you have. You know, when I was in Arkansas, I was a youth pastor and I couldn't afford much. I was poor and didn't really know how poor I was, but I had an old car and, and, and it was it was an old car, but it was sufficient. And, you know, I took care of that car. I waxed that car. I washed that car. I talked to that car. The paint was oxidizing on it. It was old. I got the oil changed in that car. I made sure it was in working order. And I told that car, you're called into the ministry. You're such a fortunate car because I, you belong to me. And, you know, I, but I took care of the car. And, and it, it wasn't a great car, but it was my car. And I, instead of thinking, you know, someday I'm going to have a nice car, uh, but today I got this piece of junk. Instead of looking at it that way, I tried to take care of what I had. That is the key to promotion. God's a God of promotion. And if you're constantly despising what God has done for you and what God has put in your hand, you're going to miss the step to your next miracle. You've got to appreciate what you have. He said, I have a rod. And God said, I can use that. Isn't that interesting? The w widow said, I have a jar of oil. God said, I can use that. As long as you bring something to the table. But don't come to the table and say, I got nothing. I can't do anything. And I'm disappointed and depressed. Lord, I need help. No, bring something to the table. What do you have? Bring that. You've got a talent. You've got a possession. You've got some money. You've got some friends. You've got some connections. Maybe you have a gift. Maybe you have a calling. Bring what you have. Don't despise it because that's a way to stay stuck in a rut. 
He said, I have a rod. And God said, cast it on the ground. Well, he cast the rod on the ground and it became a serpent and Moses fled from it. Moses just didn't, he, he was just, he was a lot to work with. I'm telling you, God knows how to work with people. Even you, God can work with you. So Moses just was two steps behind all the time. He said, it's just a rod. And he said, throw it on the ground. He threw it on the ground and it became a snake and Moses ran away from it. And the Lord said to Moses, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. And, you know, I'm surprised he got Moses to do that, but he did. He reached out and he caught it and it became a rod in his hand. And, the, then, and then the Lord said that they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob has appeared to you. So the point is, God took something he had. He, if you despise everything you have, if you don't see yourself as having anything or having done anything, listen, you have life, you have breath in your body, you may have an idea, you may have a talent, you may have a $5, if that's more than nothing, at least that's something to start with. So there are things that you have in your hand that you may not be using because you don't see the significance. I see this all the time. People don't see the significance of anything that they do or have and it limits their promotion. It slows their progress. Appreciate what you have. Let's go on and look at this again. Samson in, in Judges 15. This is a great story uh, of a person who is very difficult to work with. Samson in um, 14, Judges 15, verse 14. Then he came to Lehi and the Philistines came shouting against him. Then the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and the ropes that were on his arms became like flax. That is, they burned with fire, and his bonds broke loose from his hands. And he found a fresh jawbone of a donkey and reached out his hand and took it and killed a thousand men with it. And then Samson said, With the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps, with the jawbone of a donkey, I've slain a thousand men. And so this is just a great example of this principle that, that I, I want to, to impress upon your mind. What was so strategic about the jawbone of a donkey? Well, nothing. It, it says he reached out his hand and took it. It was something he could reach. You know, sometimes people are looking for things that are beyond their reach. And, they, and, and if you feel like the key to your miracle is beyond your reach, then you're going to give up. You're not going to try. You're not going to give God anything to work with. But he, he, he was surrounded. He was in trouble. And he reached out. And obviously there was a donkey carcass there. And he felt like the, the jawbone was the closest thing that appeared to be a weapon in the skeleton of that donkey. You know, he didn't grab the tail. And he didn't grab the toe. He grabbed the jawbone because it was more like a club, obviously. And he took that and God was able to use that and, and put his power with what was within Samson's reach. So Samson did his part and God did his part and the victory was won. Isn't that powerful? <laughs> it was he reached out his hand and took it. Oh, there's so many stories I could tell you about, about times when you feel overwhelmed and you feel like, I don't know what to do next. And it seems like, uh, you know, my next step is a total mystery that what I need is not even within my, my, my sphere. I can't, I can't, I don't even know the, the address, much less to how to get to it. And yet the miracle was right there within your reach. What do you have? Quit focusing on what you don't have and be thankful for what you do have. I gave this illustration uh, of Jesus feeding the multitude uh, with the, the loaves and fish. And remember the disciples came and said, you know, they've been here all day and everybody's hungry and tired. Send them away that they may buy food for themselves or they're gonna faint on the way. And Jesus said, you feed them. And they said, we, we can't feed this many people. It was 5,000 men. We don't have the food to feed five. And Jesus said, you remember what he said? What? Go, go see what you have. Now, obviously, five loaves, the, the, the inventory was five loaves and two fish. That's not enough to feed 5,000 people. That's not enough to feed five people, probably. But, but, but that's what they had. And it was important to Jesus that they go 
Find, find out what you have. What do you have? What is within your reach? And God was able to use that and feed the multitude. Now, God could have fed the multitude. He could have said, now just back off and watch. And He could have spoken and, and bread could have fallen out of heaven or whatever. Fried chicken, whatever you, you could imagine, could have fallen right out of heaven and fed 5,000 people. But that's just not how the miraculous tends to operate. God wants your participation. Until we use what we have, God's not going to use what He has. He needs, you know, this whole thing is a cooperation. God didn't put us on earth so we could just sit back and watch Him live life, so that we could watch Him do things for us, for our entertainment or for our excitement. It's a, it's a, it's a joint effort, and God gets pleasure out of it. He doesn't want to create victims out of us. He doesn't want to create helpless individuals out of us. He wants us to participate. And that's why we take what we have and, and, and we use it, we divide it, we give it, we sow it. We take what we have and use that to get to the next step, the next level. I'll give you, uh, you know, I can give you more examples of this, but, but let me just say this. Uh, what you have it should be valued. You need to appreciate what God has done for you to bring you to this point in your life. If you're despising where you are and what you have, you're not being thankful for what God has already done. You need to be thankful for what God has done to this point, to bring you to this point, to give you life, to give you, uh, to feed you every day and clothe you every day. God did that. Be thankful for that. And begin to take inventory of what you have and what you can do with that. Our next step, which we're going to get into, is, is not only use what you have, but do what you can. These things get you involved in the process. They make you a participant. God wants to be your partner. He doesn't just want to be the, the star, the performer. He wants, to, he wants us to perform with Him. He wants us to enjoy working with Him. And when we, when we despise what we have and think we have nothing, then, then we don't give Him anything to work with. Does that make sense? What a powerful principle. I'm going to repeat it. Use what you have, do what you can, and start where you are. I'd like to take just a minute to, to, to tell you where we are and what we're doing. We have done this in our own ministry. I have taken what I've had, and we have used it and spent it, and we've open brand new doors and new ways of getting the gospel out. But I can't do it by myself. And I was thinking about this, praying about it. I thought, Lord, why, why do we have to depend on people to give to ministry? Why, why is that? Why am I in this position? I'd, I'd rather not be here doing that. I'd rather just pay for it myself. And you know, the Lord wants us to do things together. He didn't just call men, men and women into the ministry and say, now look, uh, I don't have a better way for you to get money, so you're just going to have to beg. That's not what this is. In fact, receiving offerings, giving and receiving is God's best way. He did that on purpose. He didn't want me to be self-funded. He didn't want me to just go out and do ministry by myself and have you just watch. He wants to have people participate. Now, that's not my decision, but it's His decision. And He's made it very clear to me that there are people out there in our audience today that are destined to be our partners, that are destined to help us. Not because I'm begging and I, I have to have your money or I can't go on, but because God's called us together. Now, if that doesn't register on your spirit, then just don't worry about it. Don't think a thing about it. But if it does, if you sense that nudge of the spirit, if you say, yeah, you know what? I want to get involved and do something together. I want to be involved in ministry and getting the good news out. Then come to our website and look at our partner page and we'll show you different ways to give. There are different partner levels. I'll communicate with you. We'll give you free gifts. I pray for you. I think about you. I communicate with you. Send prayer requests in. It's a two-way street when you become partners with Greg Fritz Ministries. So consider being a partner. Consider giving to help us continue this. We don't have any gimmicks or scams. I'm not selling anything other than the, the materials that we get out to people. But, but this really is about getting the message to the world. And you say, well, the message is free, and it is free, but it costs money to get it out. 
and that's what we need help with. If God's speaking to you today to help us, please contact us, email me, go to my website, and you'll find out all the ways that you can help and be a part of this ministry. Thank you for your consideration today. Thank you for being a viewer, a part of our Good News audience. We've got more to come in this series on Get Out of the Rut, and we'll get started in our next session. Until then, may God's best be yours. Has it ever seemed as if you couldn't get ahead in life? Stop waiting to be rescued. The key to your miracle is always within your reach. Order your copy of this series, Get Out of the Rut, at gregfritz.org. Paul asked this question in 1 Corinthians 9, 7, who goes to war at his own expense? Or who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its fruit? Or who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk of the flock? This is a very simple way to say that we need help. Ministers are ordained to receive help from those they minister to. So I have a very simple request. If this program has been a blessing to you and you have some money to give, if you want to reach out and touch the world in a different way, help me get the Good News program out to more people. We are receiving downloads constantly, reports from people all over the world that are being helped by this program, but I can't do it by myself. I can't go to war at my own expense, but if, but if you'll help, together we can do something that will reach the world with the good news. Consider that, pray about it, come to our website, we've got several ways for you to give, and we'll be looking forward to hearing from you soon. We invite you to donate and partner with us today. Learn more at gregfritz.org. Greg Fritz Ministries is reaching new people daily with the Word of God online and at conferences. I have never heard of Greg Fritz. I actually never heard of Greg, Greg Fritz before this conference, but he's really funny and I love listening to him. That's what happens in services like this. Oh, you can't see it, but in the Spirit, in the Holy Spirit will make sure that we do. We'll be talking about this and talking about that and seeds are going out all over the congregation. And you may have come and said, I need you to do something for me, God. I've got to have my miracle. Well, listen, because it's those who hear that receive. It's those who hear. The Bible says, be careful how you listen. For to those who hear, more will be given. Isn't that an ingenious plan? If you have been encouraged by Greg Fritz Ministries, please partner with us to reach more people with the good news of Jesus. Coming up next on Good News with Greg Fritz. And I believe many people have been stuck in their, in their condition because they're trying to do something they're not called to do or they're trying to be something that they're just not capable of being. I think we need to be honest about things. Uh, I've tried and everybody tries not to hurt somebody's feelings and that's good. We don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. But sometimes you just need the truth at the expense of your feelings. I can give you some humorous examples just to make the medicine go down. But I, I, uh, in traveling to churches over the years, especially in the earlier days, we'd have longer meetings and we'd have, if we had a Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday night meeting, uh, a lot of times we'd have what they call a special. And that would be a, a person that would come sing a special song before the minister comes, the guest minister comes to speak. 